Hi everyone, welcome to Your Next Normal and in collaboration with America Meditating Radio. I'm your host, Sister Jenna, and I love joining you and I'm looking so forward to today's conversation because there are some bits and pieces in what we're about to talk to that are very personal. But before we welcome our very special guest, you know, many of us have had the experience of the sense that we've lost someone. I remembered when my grandmother passed away a few years ago and she and I were like two peas in a pod and she had a stroke and I went to see her and I believe and I know we're all souls and the soul is immortal and eternal imperishable it never dies but what I was missing is the soul playing the part of my grandmother that I won't be seeing her for a while at least in that form but I do sometimes look out for her in a different form. I don't know. She might be a little boy, a little girl that I'm playing with at five, ten, eight years old, which is about how long ago she left me. And because I believe that if as a soul I leave my body and I still have issues I haven't completed or I'm still attached to people here, I'm going to come back. I feel that truth in all my heart. I do. The reason why I say that is that I see the complexity of the way we unfold our personalities with each other, as if there's something lacking in us, as if there's something that we've forgotten or lost, as if there's something that I need to get before I leave, something that I need to get fulfilled in me. It feels like there's a lingering of something of my past still in me, which I haven't completed, and I'm back to try it all over again. So for me, death is not a finale. But it is a sense of, I'm going to miss the way my soul interacted with you and the part that you're playing. And I hope I'm opening up your mind to a very new conversation that we're going to have today. Because in some societies, people are often quite uncomfortable talking about the idea of death and dying, even when it's necessary to do so. There are many mysteries, taboos and superstitions surrounding the topics. Right now, our special guest today, Julie McFadden, who's an RN and BSN, also known as the Hospice Nurse Julie, has been a nurse for 14 years. She's an experienced ICU and now hospice palliative nurse who has been featured in Newsweek, USA Today, The Atlantic, several other articles worldwide. Julie has been passionate about normalizing death through education to the masses using social media. Her TikTok has over 900,000 followers. Can you believe that? I have like nine. And her Instagram has over 100,000 and it's growing strong and I'm sure it'll grow more even after today's show. Please welcome Julie on the air for me. Hi, Julie. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Hi, so nice to meet you. And you have been opening my mind listening to you. It's <laughs> In interesting, isn't it? It's interesting yeah, because it's such a great I'm, topic. you know, death is, it's the feeling that I'm dying to the part and to the role that I've played for such a long time, but you can feel it. The spirit in you is alive. The spirit that you are stays alive. But before we go into that deeper aspect and blow everyone's mind, let us gently <laughs> massage it. After working in intensive care for nine years, what actually inspired you to transition to palliative care? So working in the ICU for nine years, uh, you know, slowly but surely, you know, the first couple of years of nursing, you're always just learning so much. So you're really, at least from my, my experience, you're really overwhelmed. You're dreaming of nursing literally every night, you know, so the first couple of years, you're just learning. Then slowly over the next few years after that, I just started seeing that we were all, even healthcare workers, were having a very difficult time discussing real goals with patients and families around death and dying. And they needed to happen because this person laying in this bed was most likely not going to get better. And that's a really difficult conversation to have with families. And um, I noticed we weren't having it. And I thought this is really doing this family and this patient a really just a big disservice. Um, so as I grew confident and started asking 
you know, the providers and the doctors and the teams there about, let's have this conversation. I started seeing that I could make real change um, in this unit I was working in by being the one to kind of speak up. And mm-hmm. then that transition into me being like, I want to do this all the time. I want, I think, wow. I think, I think I want to work in hospice and palliative care and be able to have these conversations um, when needed. Can I take you back to the first time a patient passed away in front of you? What were you feeling? Do you remember? Um, I, I think it was gratitude. The, so I don't know if this is really the first time. But the one that really stands out, there were two patients that really stand out that I really feel like I made a significant difference in their life by being the one to talk about their death. Because I knew it was, it was like my colleagues and I were talking very openly about the fact that they were going to die in this hospital bed. Um, not crudely, but just, we just knew from being experienced that this, this person was not gonna make it out of here. And we were not having that discussion it gives me chills. And then finally, I just spoke up during rounds and said, you know, when are we going to talk about uh, like goals for this person? You know, and I knew what they all knew what I meant, which was like, the goal is this person's going to die peacefully in this ICU. And we need to have a family meeting about this so we can tell the family that. So then they can make the decision to turn off these, well, whether they wanted to or not to turn off the machines, turn off the medication that was keeping their loved one alive. And mm. sure, you know, and once we did, of course, the family was like, no, we don't want them living like this. You know, this is not a life. And if it's not mm. going to get better, we are going to turn off these machines. And yeah, I remember when they chose that and then they did, um, it was really, it was, it, it was, it actually didn't feel sad because what felt sad was the months that led up to that them Mm. hanging on every word of what we were saying about their small little details of their creatinine level or their, you know, their liver enzymes that, uh, Mm. versus really knowing what was happening. Right. So it felt, um, I felt gratitude and I felt like, wow, I I felt good that I was able to speak up and allow this family to grieve and mourn and and start the next journey of their, of their life. Interesting. Yeah. Take me back to your childhood. Did you ever lose somebody who was very close to you? Because not many people are comfortable with the process of transitioning and even getting the thought of being caring enough to think about what other people are going through. I mean, was there something that impacted you as a child? Hmm, That's a great question. So uh, I guess as a teenager, and I don't know if this is if this, this may have, it definitely impacted me. I don't know if it impacted me in my career, but I, as a 17 year old, my best friend died tragically in an accident. So I feel like that's such a strange age to have such a huge loss. Um, And uh, so that really opened my eyes to, wow, people die. (laughs) Of course, we kind of know that, but like, I think experiencing a sudden loss like that is very like, I, you know, you realize, okay, this can really happen. And, 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 and uh, so that definitely impacted me. I don't know if that made me comfortable with death. I would say as a child, I've always been uh, like a seeker. Like even as like a five-year-old, I'd be like, what is this life? Why are <laughs> we here? Um, I would ask those questions. I remember being like, why are we here? What happens when we die? Yeah. Why are we going to this building on Sunday? Like I just, um, <laughs> I just was always like that. Always, even as a very little girl. Oh, this is great to hear. Questions. Yeah. No, it's important because in the questions, something gets stimulated up here and something happens out here as mm-hmm. a result of that. This year, I also lost my brother in Chennai and uh, he was speaking to his wife at nine o'clock, 9.30. And by 12 o'clock, we got a call. He fell off the bed and just passed away in his 40s. One of the things that's so profound about that is it makes you think about the way you're living. Mm-hmm. the way you've been living your life. I know it sounds a little selfish. Your brother dies and then you start thinking about yourself. But we're so interconnected because his life was so rich and everything he did was so noble and so good. And I remembered the feeling like, no, that can't be. No, no, he can't. His role can't end yet. 
you know, and, and you go into all of these thoughts that you know you don't need to have, mm -hmm. but you have them anyway, because maybe you're just trying to process some of the questions you had from you were a little girl. Why are we here? What is the significance? But look at you. You've got over 900,000 followers on TikTok. I don't even know what TikTok is. And your videos, and your videos have gone, <laughs> they've gone viral. Why do you think there's so much interest in hearing your experiences as a hospice nurse on death and dying? Uh, let me tell you. So it was so validating to see this happening and it happened very quickly. And I will say, like when you said, I don't even know TikTok, I feel I'm on TikTok <laughs> and I <laughs> and I do it daily. And I still feel like I I I don't I don't know, know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Um it really happened pretty happenstance. Like that's why I feel like I'm just in this rant uh, amazing flow of like what's supposed to be un unfolding because Good. I went on TikTok to watch my nieces do silly dances and they were telling me to be on TikTok. So I did it almost as a joke. And then to see these other creators really spreading a lot of amazing um, knowledge, like teaching people and things, I was like, wow, this is really great. And I knew I had a few videos or a few pieces of information that I wanted people to know about death and dying. But I thought either no one's going to see it because who wants to talk about death and dying, or maybe this will strike a chord in people. And I feel like it struck a chord, you know, and people want to, uh, people, despite what they say, they want to learn about death and dying. And I yeah. think there are many fascinating things about the dying body that most people don't know. And yeah. Um, yeah. so, yeah, people liked it and here I am. I'm glad because we found you. I'm glad that you're educating people on death and maybe it's also helping to ease their fears. But what, you know, when we look at this journey, the passion that we bring into everything that we do, and you've spoken a little bit about that as well. Well, what would you say? Tell me a little bit about what would you say to a person who is aware that their loved one will no longer be here? in the form that they're accustomed to? Hmm. What would I say? So to me, I do a lot of listening at that time, really. So, cause what I'm, when I'm coming to this person as, uh, as the healthcare worker, right. As the hospice nurse, um, they have a lot of questions and, and their questions are not they're not really about what's it going to be like once they're gone. It's more like, what's it going to be like while they're going, the process of going. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do a lot of educating about what to expect. You know, uh, what does the dying body look like? Mm -hmm. um, what's very normal that they might not be used to seeing. And once we start talking about that, then they have a lot of, a lot of questions uh, and which I, which I answer for the most part. Um, and mm -hmm. then once they're gone, I, I always just try to normalize everything they're thinking and feeling, right? I think we're all really uncomfortable with feeling uncomfortable <laughs> and feeling bad, <laughs> including me. Like you said, like with the, especially, you know, with sudden deaths, you start going, you, you, you dive into all types of guilty feelings, you know, why am I still here and they're not here? Um, I always educate about them maybe feeling relief once their loved one's gone, like, like yeah. I'm a gamut of emotions, but one of the emotions could be relief because, and then shame for feeling relief. Um, it's and amazing. it's because it's really hard. It's really hard to watch your loved one go through this. And then mm -hmm. once they're not suffering anymore, or once they're um, not in this ailing body anymore and, and not, and it's a lot of work, that is true. It's a lot of work on the loved one to be there for this dying person. Yeah, they may yeah. feel relief. They may feel relief. So I try to yeah. just normalize the fact that like, you're going to feel all types of crazy <laughs> and that's very normal. And FYI, yeah. hospice will be there for the family for one year after their loved one dies. So wow. just because, just because your loved one dies, it doesn't mean we're gone. We still are there for the bereavement part, which lasts much longer than a year, but, but the company will be around you know, your hospital so nice. will be there for you. Yeah, it's amazing. It's so nice. You know, my mother has a very acute state of dementia. And I just call it, she's very entertaining. I don't even like to use the D word, mm -hmm. but she's quite entertaining. And um, 
just a few days ago, I was talking to my friend that I, I think I need to find a funeral home that we can just pay and have her ready if anything happens. And it was interesting. I felt that, am I forcing and pushing her process to depart? Or is this just my responsibility, what I'm supposed to do so that when she does depart, my state of mind is in a good place to spiritually be there to support her journey in her next role that she she's preparing to play. Any thoughts about that? Like how any advice for someone like me to think that, well, it's, I don't know, she could be here for another day, she could be here for another 20 years, I don't know, but at least let me allow this process of her transition to be easy. And so I'm looking now for funeral parlors to um, support that. But inside, I want to feel right, Julie. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions? Well, um, I think you said it perfectly. Uh, to me, planning is good for anybody. I could plan my funeral right now. You could plan what you want for your for your um, like burial or however you want to do it. Like you said, the mortuary plans. I think everyone should plan that no matter what time of life, because of what you said, when yeah. that, when that um, like checkbox stuff is off the list, you can just be there. Like, cause when, once it happens or when it's happening, if it's a process, which it'll likely be for your mother, it'll be likely be this process versus a sudden thing. I mean, again, you never know, but generally speaking, it's usually what it will be. I think when all of those like, um, I've been having trouble finding my words lately, but when all of those things that you have to do are checked off your list, I think you can just be with your yeah. loved one. And that's, and what, that's I want. what I think. Yeah. And that's what I think is important because if, yeah, I, if, if you don't have a plan, then it can be a little bit of a whirlwind. Yeah. I don't want to be making calls, doing this, doing that at a time when I just want to sit with her soul in God's remembrance and just hold her. You know, and it's funny because since the age of 19, I've had a life insurance plan just in case if anything happens to me, I'll never be a burden on my parents and they will be fine when I leave. And I've already done all of these things that if I pass away, here's what I want everyone to do. And there's something within me, though, I feel so at peace, you know, not only knowing that when I leave, everyone's going to be rich, but also that when I leave, they'll be at peace and they know exactly what I want to have done so that they're happy and I will be watching them from above going, you know what it's all about, right? You know, we're here to just do this, right? All right, you know, that's how I want everyone to feel. So I've done that work and I think that's really great. Um, in terms of some of the individuals that you've been in service to, would you say that there are a few, you know, maybe top five regrets, top three to five regrets that people have often mentioned to you about before they come to that transition? Uh, yes, I don't know how many it is, but the top, the top ones I always hear are people, uh, and I'm guilty of this, you know, people not appreciating their health and their functional ability enough, right? So like just taking for granted that I could go for a walk, like that could go away, <laughs> you know? Um, so people not, people not, them being like, I can, I, I didn't appreciate my health. You know, I didn't appreciate my health. I didn't appreciate my independence. So those ones ring a bell. And then people who say um, that they were waiting to do things like once, especially the whole like retirement thing. Once I retire, then I'll do all the things I want to do. People waiting for that. So people saying like, don't wait to do things you want to do. Live life now. Um, which all of these, I feel like seem kind of basic or like kind of like, this is what we'd all think they would say, but that is what they say. You know, they, they, they're, they would say, I wish I didn't work my life away. Um, I wish I'd appreciate what I, what the health I have now and, um, don't wait to do the things you want to do. And what about love and forgiveness? There were a lot of them, you know, kind of realize I should have loved more. I should have not hated more. Have you heard that? Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that. I feel like that's that. Yes, I have heard that. I feel like that yeah. doesn't stand out to me, which sounds mm -hmm. crazy, but, um, Yes, I've heard that or or families, all that matters, you know, which I don't I mean, whatever your chosen family is, I think it depends on the family dynamics, right? It really does yeah. depend on the person's who the person yeah. is and was and um, 
<laughs> but I but I have heard that. That's 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 a top one, but not the most. Well, interesting. I'm surprised to hear that. So phenomena, tell me one or so. Um, what phenomena have you seen people actually experience during the end of life process? Like, do they tell you about the light that they see? I mean, in my teachings of Raj Yoga meditation, we educate everyone to focus on the energy of God as this being of light. And there are a few who have had near-death experiences and they've come back and said, Sister Jenna, that's exactly what you told us that we are and we're connected to. I says, yes, but you have to live the experience of that light here. Don't wait until it's time to depart because you're missing a lot from the experience of being here with it. Um, any phenomena that you've heard from folks? Yes, who are Sister Jenna. On? First off, I love what you just said, and I couldn't agree more. Um, and I feel like I have experienced that, the connectedness yeah. of, and anyway. So, um, yeah, so the number one, the number one thing is visioning. And I love talking about it because it happens, I mean, so often that I can barely even think of one specific time because it happens all the time. And visioning is when people who are dying, usually about a month to a few weeks before they die, will start talking or being or saying, saying their loved ones who have already died are in the room with them and talking to them. So are visiting them. So um, they'll be talking to dead relatives, talking to old friends, playing with old dogs, um, and they're lucid. They don't have low oxygen levels. So that's what people always say. They have low oxygen, so they're hallucinating, or it's a medication, so they're hallucinating, which again, I don't, we don't actually know why it happens, but I can tell you from a nursing standpoint, they don't have low oxygen. They're not hallucinating. I know what hallucinations look like and what delirium looks like and delusions look like. This is not that. This is very clear, very comforting. Um, and it happens, I mean, 80% of the time. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's incredible how often it happens. So that's the number one phenomenon that we don't, we can't explain. And I wouldn't just say that any healthcare worker in the hospice or palliative care world would also acknowledge that. We put it in like our educational books so people know to expect it um, or something to ex something that's normal so they know when they start seeing it and their loved one, they're not losing their mind, you know, <laughs> it's okay. Um, mm. So that's the, the main one. And then other ones are like the rally where they have a, a surge of energy or a burst of energy at the, at the very end uh, and then they die usually shortly after. Those are the yeah. two that really stand out. But there's yeah. there's, a, there's several. Would you say that um, witnessing all the patients that have transitioned in front of you is it a painful process or it's a very peaceful process? Um, so dying is not painful. The, the the process of dying, our bodies are built to die. So the things that could be painful would be the dis certain diseases that you're dying from, right? Um, but in general, I would say no when they are, especially in the actively dying phase, where it's like an hour, a few hours to a few days, um, all I see is peace for the most part. Wow, I love um, that. The body is doing things. The body does things. This is a process for the body, but it's not a painful process. I love that. You know, I think that's why in my training of the Raj Yoga meditation, that's by the Brahma Kumaris, um, the practice of soul consciousness is a natural sort of detachment from the body while you're still living. Mm -hmm. That if you can focus more on the energy of the soul that you are while you're speaking, while you're moving your hands, you're aware that if my soul is not in my body, I'm not going to be talking to you right now. And if an individual can develop that habit, then just imagine when the body is saying, you know what, this car is done driver, you're going to have to go buy yourself a new model, you know? And so when the soul is just feeling, I can't stay in this, this vehicle anymore, mm -hmm. it's not suitable for the person that I am, that it just, it just moves off. I've often at, wanted to ask if it was, um, I've often seen that it's not challenging, except if the soul is attached to the part and the body and the people, I find the greatest struggle is I don't want to leave them. I, I, I want to be here for them. I've seen that. Yeah, um, I have too. Yeah, right? That's been always... Mm -hmm. I've often heard too, when the relatives actually leave the room is when the soul leaves most times. Is that true? Um, 
it really depends. I feel like it depends on maybe the soul or the person because sometimes yeah. they'll wait for everyone to get there or they'll wait for everyone to leave or sometimes they choose. I've definitely seen people say, I'm going to die this day. <laughs> and then wow. they do. I know it's, do. A, it's crazy. And they do. I mean, not often, but people have definitely said, or they say, I want to make it until my son gets married. And then the son will get married and they'll die the next day. It's not you know? that powerful. It shows the power of your yeah. thoughts, no, and will. What have you learned the most playing this part for over 14 years now? And, you know, you know, what you're doing is not only helping people's bodies, but families, but also that soul who sees you in that ICU, even if they're incapacitated and they can't speak and they're on the machine and you come into that room knowing it's going to be okay. It's just your body is going to change, but you'll be fine. I mean, what what are you learning, you know, at that moment when you've done this so often now? What has it made, Julie? The, the biggest thing that I have learned that I wanted to tell the world before I started, you know, this is why I'm on social media, is acceptance. So to me, what I have learned, what people have shown me through their dying process, end of life journey is the more we're able to accept what is, uh, the more peaceful and better we will live and the more peaceful we'll die. Like yeah. hands down, that is what people have shown me over and over and over again. And, um, and that dying is sacred and it is, that's what it feels like to me. Being in a room of a actively dying patient feels sacred it's like when you're witnessing a birth it feels like that it may not feel like that for the for the loved ones because they're grieving right they're, they don't want to lose this person but as a healthcare worker who can be there just to be the witness it's it's a beautiful sacred thing yeah you know it's an interesting mystery that you've just unfolded because it's because of your element of detachment to that person it makes it easy for you to accept. And maybe I struggle with not accepting what the universe is saying, this is preordained for you to go through, is the attachments that we still hold within ourselves and for each other. Interesting yeah. note to end on. Yeah. Hey, is there anything else you'd like to say? I've really loved being with you and I've got to start to figure out this TikTok. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, you do, it's great. Actually, I don't know, I don't know. But I mean, I like it, but who knows? No, I mean, we're glad. Was, we're, glad was, we're, we're glad you're yeah. doing what you're doing. Thank you. I'm glad you're doing. What, I'm glad to to see what you're doing. You're amazing to listen to. And, Thank you. Um, yeah, we can I do it. We'll, we'll do a TikTok together. Yeah, we'll do a TikTok together. <laughs> I'll show you. I'll sh I'll show you the ropes. Okay. <laughs> Any last words that you'd like to share with our audience? You know, you ask such great questions. I feel like everything I wanted to say, I I said. You asked amazing questions. It's always the acceptance part. I would, if you didn't ask that, I, I would have said something about that. Because <laughs> that's the main thing I want people to know. Acceptance is the answer. Yeah, you're fantastic. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you, you too. Website, website, TikTok. How do we find oh, you? Um, Sorry so, about that. No, it's okay. So I am, I don't, I don't have a website yet. But um, I'm on all social media platforms. So YouTube, face, Facebook, um, Instagram, and TikTok at Hospice Nurse Julie. Could you tell us what the address is? It's at Hospice Nurse Julie. So you just put at Hospice Nurse Julie. And that's where you could find, if you plug that into any of the social media platforms, you will find me. At Hospice Nurse Julie, correct? Yeah, that's right. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. That's pretty easy. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thanks to Julie. I think we've been able to embrace the process of death or what we might be calling now the transitioning of the soul as it leaves the body and the part that it's been playing for five years, 10 years, 50 years, 50, 80 years, that maybe it's not as bad as we think it's been. And maybe it's really been all the suffering that we see the loved ones left behind that we thought it was a bad thing. But for the person who's dying, maybe it just isn't. Maybe it's finally their respite, their time to just say, ah, oh, I can just be at peace. I know it's controversial to question, does the soul go back to God or does it come back here? Well, I'm gonna leave you to ponder on that. 
sometimes I wonder if the soul goes to God and goes to heaven, then what do you call this down here, number one? And number two, if the person has been awfully mean, you mean he also gets to go to heaven? Yes, maybe so. <laughs> These are the thoughts that you could have. But three, what if life is one of the most beautiful things that you could ever have? And maybe we're given many, many chances. One birth, two birth, five births, 10 births, 80 births. Maybe we're given chances to try to figure it out, to just do it right, to bring the energy of God's love and light into everything you do. And maybe, maybe when you're able to master that, that's when we go back home to source. And that's when the peace really sinks in. And that's when we rest for a while before we're ready to come back. I leave that for you to ponder on. Thank you so much for joining us on our America Meditating Radio in collaboration with Next Normal. Feel free to come by and visit our meditation museum. It's now open on Saturdays between 1 to 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and there are wonderful programs going on there. And of course, as you know, America Meditating is all yours in whatever platform you'd like to listen it to. And I have to give a shout out to Viome. I'm feeling a whole lot better. And if you want to go to americameditating.org and click on that page, why don't you join me in feeling healthier, looking better. <laughs> take care and be well. And you know what? Nobody has the power to take away your happiness unless you give them permission. Nobody. Absolutely not one soul. And I suspect that we're here to develop the art of loving each other the same. So let's make the world a better place. Om Shanti. Take care.